two uh, major uh, themes that it addresses that may not be uh, addressed as well as they should right now and probably will be addressed uh, at some length going forward. But certainly uh, the whole uh, matter of agility and the need for changes in strategy that are associated with that whole phenomenon that we think of as agility. An effective culture makes change easier. It actually makes leadership easier to the extent that leadership is about the management of change. And so uh, to have an agile uh, strategy, uh, you've got to have a culture that will support that uh, phenomenon. And it also means because culture is not easy to change, it takes a while, uh, it means a culture that's able to support more than one strategy or uh, to support strategy change. So I think that's one major theme that the book uh, addresses and the idea that uh, uh, we look for the kinds of values that support agility, uh, oh, things like uh, 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 teamwork, things like uh, learning, things like personal development and all of those kinds of things. Uh, the, the other major phenomenon is the ch change in the nature of work and the implication that that has for an organization's culture. Uh, I, I devote an entire uh, section of the book to the whole idea of the hybrid organization and uh, the kind of uh, culture that's needed to make that successful. But in fact, um, we have to face it. Hybrid organizations are going to be a major chain, a challenge to, to organization culture. Uh, it, there's no question about the fact that if you have some of your people working remotely some of the time, uh, you're going to have a different phenomenon uh, when it comes to the, to the organization's culture. And uh, through the example of uh, an organization like uh, Critical Mass, which is located in Calgary, Canada, uh, Diane Wilkins, the CEO there, uh, I tried to characterize the challenges that uh, changes in the nature of work are going to have for us. And uh, so I think that uh, those are things that uh, the book addresses. I try to inject a sense of urgency into the whole process or the challenge of changing a culture. I think uh, uh, changing a culture is too much like climate change. You know, it, we all agree it's necessary and we all agree that we need to do something to, to change, to, to, to uh, address it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, off there somewhere in the future where it's probably something we can't do during our tenure as a leader, and therefore uh, it gets shoved aside, uh, unfortunately, and perhaps uh, rarely addressed. For example, a, a, a study uh, done by faculty members at Duke University found that uh, leaders by and large uh, get the notion that uh, culture is important and an important determinant of, of performance. Uh, over 90% uh, said that uh, uh, they needed, they could probably in, uh, improve their culture. Uh, fewer than 20% said that they'd actually done anything about it. So uh, people get it, they just don't do anything about it. And the reason they probably uh, put it aside or postpone it has to do with a lot of the way we think about, for example, climate change. We all agree that we need to address it, but uh, it takes too long uh, to do it. It'll probably uh, have to be handed off to some other leader. And uh, frankly, we've just got too much to do today to, to deal with shorter term problems. We'll get to it later. And of course, 
they never do. I think the jury is probably still out, but I'm certainly willing to consider the notion that uh, middle management is not dead. And in fact, uh, may be revived to some extent uh, in a hybrid culture. Uh, there are several things we probably agree on as being important in that kind of a culture. We agree that, uh, uh, that working in a hybrid fashion is going to be a real challenge to organizations that wish to maintain their culture. Uh, it was, uh, I think, Greg Carmichael, the uh, 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 CEO of Fifth Third uh, uh, Bank Organization, said, uh, you know, if we're going to be great, we have to have people in the office. Uh, uh, we can manage in a hybrid fashion, but we'll never be great. And he used that as a rationale for bringing them in. I think hybrid organizations can be successful. Uh, the critical mass example that I mentioned earlier is the, an example of an organization that is trying to make uh, hybrid work uh, successful, not only for themselves, but for their clients as well. Uh, but it requires certain things. It requires uh, not just uh, coaching, but it requires advocacy uh, for people who are working remotely. And who's going to be the advocate? if we don't have a middle manager somewhere in that mix who is tuned in to what's going on back at the office and can make sure that uh, the person, the people he's working with or she's working with are tuned in as well. Secondly, you've got to have face-to-face -face contact. That, that, that's pretty clear. And the question is how much and when and how, and that varies from one organization to another, but without face-to-face -face contact, it, it, will, it will never uh, provide the kind of uh, boost that really leads to a great organization. I don't think organizations assume that they're, going to, uh, they're not going to get their people together occasionally. Uh, I think if we're expecting, um, Increases in productivity, we might get uh, we might get modest increases in productivity, uh, uh, and the way we'll do that is by uh, redesigning work in such a way that uh, the creative work can get done in certain time slots, and the routine work probably gets done in other time slots. But uh, overall, it seems to me that an effective culture. Uh, will ensure that uh, there is adequate advocacy, that there is uh, the right amount of face-to-face -face contact, and uh, that certain really important values come to the fore. Inclusion, voice. Uh, uh, my colleague Amy Edmondson talks about uh, the importance of voice voice will become more and more important because those people working out in, uh, in uh, their own uh, residence or whatever still need to have voice and the idea that uh, they are included and their ideas are being considered. Otherwise, I, I, I fear that uh, we're going to have serious problems with an organization's culture if we're not taking care of those things. So in a sense, it's, it's a um, symbiotic relationship. A, an effective culture uh, can make hybrid work uh, more successfully. There are some things that are, that are common uh, to all organizations so that uh, when a Zappos or a Disney uh, invites people in and shares their secrets, okay, their, their secrets regarding uh, organization culture with them, uh, what they're really sharing, I think, uh, uh, is a process for considering a change in culture. Uh, and I think that can be communicated. That can be hacked. 
you can talk in terms of the kinds of people uh, that are needed in certain situations, and that's it, uh, easily shared. I think, though, that uh, and, and you can talk about the way we do things around here and wouldn't that work for you and all that sort of thing. Uh, the, the part of it that can't be hacked, uh, I think, lies in that particular set of values and behaviors that you choose for your organization uh, that relates to the, uh, to the agility, for example, that you wish to, uh, to have uh, in your uh, strategic activities. Uh, it, it's, uh, it depends on the people you hire. And uh, I find that that's the part of the process where this so-called, I don't know, standardization or, or, or hacking process breaks down uh, because you've got, to, uh, you've got to hire the right people and you've got to fire the right people. Uh, it's the old Ken Kesey uh, saying, I guess, that, uh, uh, that Jim Collins quoted, you know, we got to get the right people on the bus and in the right seats. And you got to get them off the bus too. Uh, and, uh, and that's where the, I think uh, this process of transferability of ideas, transfer of cultures uh, breaks down. I think that's a misguided idea, uh, Raju. Uh, first of all, uh, culture and strategy are not in some kind of competition. So uh, to try to uh, juxtapose them that way, it seems to me doesn't make any sense. Uh, instead, uh, again, there is a kind of symbiotic relationship. Uh, an effective culture uh, has to support uh, an organization's strategy. Uh, I would argue it has to support more than one of an organization's strategies, but it has to support strategy. At the same time, uh, culture, uh, its culture may be an important part of an organization's strategy. Uh, for example, uh, if you go to Handelsbank in, in Sweden, uh, the, the culture of the bank, uh, which has to do with transparency and, and best practice and uh, a variety of ideas that uh, everybody agrees are important, follows through on, uh, is an important competitive element of that bank uh, and has been for some period of time. Uh, so at the same time that culture needs to support strategy, it can be an important element of an organization's strategy. So, so for somebody to say strategy or culture eats strategy for lunch, uh, it just doesn't say anything to me. I, it strikes me that it's uh, uh, kind of a random set of ideas thrown together that don't help us very much. The book implies some things that can be done at all levels, but uh, as you say, it's primarily addressed to, uh, to leaders. If I were a young person uh, entering an organization with a culture that, uh, that I felt um, left something to be desired, I would feel it in my team, for example, if, if the organization is built around teams, uh, I would be able to see whether I have, uh, uh, whether I'm being included, uh, whether I'm uh, being given a voice, uh, whether my ideas are at least considered, because uh, uh, that's probably uh, about what it takes, and whether my leader is sensitive to the, to the needs and differences uh, among the members of the team whether my team is uh, you know, three people or uh, maybe a dozen, uh, but that's the unit of work, it seems to me, at which you can start. Uh, typically, teams that exhibit that kind of behavior 
uh, rise to the top. They're they're, they show their success uh, along the way compared to other teams. Uh, that means your career is going to uh, uh, rise and your area of influence is going to increase. And as your area of in, uh, influence increases, uh, you have greater influence over how we do things around here and what kinds of values we share and and the sort of issues that we speak out on uh, as a corporation, uh, which is really a, a rather recent phenomenon uh, that uh, uh, has become uh, more and more uh, important. So I think you, you build it, Raju, as you, as you uh, build um, uh, a reputation within the organization. Now the organization has to honor that kind of behavior, uh, but uh, the, the organizations with effective cultures that I'm familiar with would love to have someone like that uh, working at the lowest levels to make sure uh, that those shared values and behaviors are, are, are being propagated uh, on the front line. One uh, big surprise was the fact that uh, in spite of the fact that John Cotter and I uh, started our work on organization culture 30 years ago, uh, I'm still finding a number of organizations that either have uh, ignored the work or <laughs> didn't read it in, or didn't access it in the first place. Uh, our, we set out to, to uh, determine the impact of, of an organization's culture on its performance. And we thought, uh, we started with a hypothesis that a strong culture uh, will produce good performance. So we measured the cultures of a number of organizations and got, came up with a group of organizations that we were told had very strong cultures in their sp uh, uh, respective industries. Uh, what we found is that uh, some of the best performers were in that group and some of the worst performers were in that group. So our hypothesis, our hypothesis got thrown out the window uh, and we went back to try to discover what it was that was different about those organizations that had strong cultures, but either were or were not performing well. And what we found uh, was that uh, those that weren't performing well had a strong culture, all right, and it was not adapting to change. They hadn't been able to adapt to change. Uh, typically, they were um, command and control types of cultures, strong, not very effective. Uh, and I told the story of several of those uh, in the book, um, this was a surprise to me because I thought perhaps our message had gotten across, but uh, to, in too many organizations, I still found uh, an effort to create the strongest kind of culture with uh, insufficient adaptability uh, to, to uh, support uh, the changes in strategy that are coming faster and faster these days. We had to go back rebuild the study, uh, we described it at great length and found that agil this adaptability is what we, we called it. Uh, agility at that time didn't seem to uh, have much uh, uh, cachet, but uh, adaptability was also important, but we still find organizations today uh, in which uh, they're striving to have a, a, a really strong culture that uh, is not very adaptable, uh, which is uh, a, a big mistake. One of the surprises was leaders who understand the importance of culture to performance still aren't doing very much about it. Uh, another surprise was the degree uh, to which there really isn't very 
a very good notion among top managers of what's going on in the organization. Something is, is, is wrong with the, pro, the channels of communication in too many organizations, even though if you think back, Tom Peters and, and, uh, and Bob Waterman told us years ago uh, that management by walking around is really an important thing to do. Uh, some organizations understand that, but too many still don't. And it's too easy uh, to, to stay in the, uh, in the ivory tower and stay out of uh, what's going on in the field. Uh, that, for example, uh, is, uh, is the, the, one of the core premises still today of an organization like Walmart, where uh, those people are out in the field four days a week uh, meeting with uh, not just store managers so that they know their senior managers and more important, their senior managers know them and they know what's going on in those stores. Hence, uh, whenever somebody says to me, uh, you know, why isn't Walmart's turnover higher? Those people are loyal because um, they know who their boss is, they know who their boss's boss is, and they know that those people care. And that makes a big difference. So uh, I, I was surprised that there are still too many organizations that don't get that message. If you run through the numbers and calculate, uh, as I did in the book, the impact of culture on bottom line performance, it's those organizations that have uh, the most people in direct contact with customers uh, in which uh, that provide the greatest opportunity for improved performance through improved culture. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to call the book uh, Compete Through Culture, but uh, the publisher wasn't too excited about that. Uh, but I honestly believe that culture is a, is a critical competitive weapon, if you will. There are uh, uh, many warning signs that a culture is starting to lag. I don't know. Uh, for example, uh, how much of my time is spent in, me in meetings, okay? That's, that's one very practical thing. Uh, uh, to what extent do people listen to each other? Uh, to what extent do people agree to do things in meetings and then ignore the, what they've agreed to? Uh, to what extent do managers in general set expectations that they can't meet with the people who are working for them. In other words, uh, to what extent um, are they able to, to uh, manage down uh, rather than managing up? Those are all uh, just very practical signs that something isn't quite right and that we really ought to probably sit down and uh, think about that. At Microsoft, for example, uh, this, uh, the senior managers decided that uh, the dynamic at meetings was to be the smartest person in the room. And you were in competition with other people who also wanted to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, they decided that that wasn't uh, a particularly uh, productive behavior and uh, used that, among other many other, many other things, as a rationale for rethinking the culture at Microsoft that resulted in a tremendous turnaround over the last five or six years. 